Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this very special edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series. Today, I have the pleasure and privilege of having of the industry leader. And when I say industry leader, mm -hmm. I'm not just talking nationally or on the at the level of the continent. I mean, at a global level, somebody I've always had the privilege to know for a while, something I do not take for granted. Today we have in the house somebody that has earned the title of professor in the industry. And even the people in the academia don't contest it. Professor Adeyemi Ajayi. I'm sure if you ask him, we just say, oh, my name is Yemi. He's a very simple and humble man. But you know, great men don't like to show up. They will say the more they know, the more they realize they, they need to know. Let me just read this profile. Today we'll be handling a very critical topic and a very timely topic on risk management in human resources. Risk management in human resources. A professional who has consistently delivered across various value chains and industries. He has handled various projects within and outside Nigeria. He has delivered various papers, spoken at different sessions, and has trained well over 15,000 conservatively within the last six years alone. Is a globally recognized HR influencer and facilitator par excellence. He is highly numerate and analytical. Adeyemi possesses hands on and brains on experience in a combination of fields, including but not limited to human resources, business analytics, data science, enterprise risk management, internal audit strategy and advocacy, business process management learning and development, training and facilitation, regulatory compliance, investment management, business advisory, to mention a few. Adeyemi started his career in Akitola Williams Deloitte as a professional accountant and external auditor. He has worked as internal control officer and risk management in Bank PHB, the bank where they used to work on waters, and now Keystone Bank. He has worked as pioneer head risk management department for ARM pensions, head of risk management and compliance with Alternative Capital Partners Limited. He is a director in Insight, Akad Capital, and Zufall Consult. He was the director of strategy, advocacy, and stakeholder relations with Chara Institute of Personal Management of Nigeria. He was the African Regional. Director, Talent Expertise International, and currently the Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer, Exiting Consulting Limited. He's a member of a number of professional bodies that include ACCA, Global Association of Risk Professionals, USA, Institute of Operational Risk in UK, Tata Institute of Personal Management in Nigeria, Nigerian Institute of Training and Development, International Association of Facilitators, Compliance Institute of Nigeria, Institute of Credit Administration of Nigeria, he is ISO 31,000 certified and a lead manager and global mentor on Adeyemi Ajayi was the chairman of Research and Publication mm -hmm. Committee of CIPF and the representative of the Institute on the Tripartite Committee for the Review of Minimum Wage of Labor in Nigeria. He has developed well over 1,000 business policies and executed several management projects, which include process reengineering, enterprise-wide risk management projects, business continuity management, and disaster recovery planning. He also, he has done business process management, management, product development, strategy formulation, and research. He has been a researcher for the pension industry for well over 10 years. Adeyemi is a researcher, facilitator, trainer, risk manager, corporate governance expert, management consultant, and a writer. He presented a paper to Harvard Business School MBA class of 2011 on reaching the unbanked in Nigeria. I must also say that he is a strong 
supporter and promoter of the HR mentorship. In fact, the first HR mentorship webinar series we ever did, guess who the speaker was? It was Professor Adi Emeagyai. The first ever mentorship series we ever did, the first webinar we ever did in HR mentorship, Professor Adi Emeagyai graced us his presence and is back again. If there's somebody that we can say, let's be, let him be teaching us week in, week out, that will not run out of steam and run out of value is Professor Ade Emergei. We read people's profile intentionally. We don't want you to be impressed. We want you to be inspired. We don't want you to be intimidated. We want you to reach for more. Thank you so much, Professor Ade Emergei. At this point, I'd like to hand over our virtual control to you. Feel free to share your slide and you can take it away from me. Welcome, Professor Ade Emergei. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm quite very uh, happy to be here. Sorry, can everybody hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Okay. Am I authorized to share my slides? Yes, please. You are a co host, sir. Oh, okay. Good evening, everyone. Let me show my face. If my internet is not working too well, you will permit me to run away from the internet space. Uh, I mean, from the picture space for uh, a little while. So I'll be discussing quite uh, something very important, and I would like us from time to time to ask our questions. I'm passionate about HR. I'm passionate about risk management, and um, I like to cross-pollinate ideas from both sides, you know, looking at what we can really gain as professionals. So. Um, We'll be talking about risk management in human resources for the next uh, 50 minutes. Uh, I'll make it quite very interactive. And I want you also to ask me questions along the line. Those I can answer along the line, I'm going to answer them. Uh, let me say, uh, press to see more that I appreciate, uh, I call him the tallest man in the, in the world. Uh, Mr. Liam uh, who has been so quite very deeply committed to the course of learning. Sincerely, he has an award in my heart. I may not send it out to him physically, but deep down in my heart, I have a deep respect for him and for the strides he's having. So um, I'm going to make it quite a bit interactive. We have a session where we need to ask some questions for just to get your perspective about things. So uh, let me move straight from here to areas of our conversation. I would be taking you through fundamentals of what the risk and risk management is, risk management process, major risk in HR functions. And please, I just want to plead with you. I don't know whether we're going to have a recording of this on the YouTube or any other channel for social learning. But I will largely want to plead that you should have your notes by your side because there are quite a few things that I'm going to talk about that you may not find in the slide. And we'll also be looking at how HR managers should manage risk. Let me tell you before I start, HR managers are one of the biggest risk managers in every organization. Unfortunately, they do not know. And I'll say that I've been able to see both sides, been able to see the side of uh, the risk manager and also been able to see the, right, the side of uh, uh, HR. And I, and I say many times that, uh, especially for organizations that don't uh, uh, value HR, they are treading uh, dangerous parts. They, they, they're working through dangerous parts. And uh, the earlier, the better organization realize uh realizes the value proposition of hr the better otherwise organization will run into trouble uh i'll also be talking about uh 23 risk outlook for hr managers which areas should you look into and concentrate on as hr managers and finally we'll be talking about to take away from this conversation so let's start uh by looking at fundamentals of uh, risk and risk management. Let me put this uh, knowledge teaser to you. Please, can you read for like a minute? Uh, I may also want to read from here, if you don't mind. 
uh, a man residing in Lagos is scheduled to have an appointment with the president of Nigeria, Muhammad Buhari. He's expected to hold a meeting by 12 p.m. on Sorry, November sir. 30th. Huh? We can't see your slide. Hello? Are you sharing it? We can't see anything. I'm sharing my slide. But I'm sharing my slide. We can't see. Oh, I can see the slide. Okay. I know, Prof. I can see your slide, ma'am. Sir, go oh, okay. ahead. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. So the president, uh, the meeting involves signing of a contract worth $2 billion. If he, that is the president, I mean, if you are, if the man is five minutes late for the meeting, the contract will be canceled automatically. What are the likely factors that may hinder him from meeting this appointment? And what do you think he should do? So let me hear from you, from the audience. I said, I'm gonna make it very interactive, okay? So what do you think this man should do? Anybody? From this short teaser, what do you think this man should do? If you want to speak, you can raise up your hands. We're here to, you know, have a conversation. I'd rather make it a conversation. What do you think this man should do? Anybody? Okay, I can see some. And Moses, let me hear from you. Or oh, what are the likely factors that will affect him? And what do you think he should do? So Moses, let me hear from you first. Hello, Moses. I think you can unmute. Okay, so okay, yeah, okay. So, um, good evening, sir. Um, I've been unmuted now, so I can speak now. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Yes, 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 Moses. Yeah. Okay, so depending on his location, one thing you have to consider first, especially in Lagos, is traffic. So, if the appointment is for twelve noon, uh um, he has to leave very early so as to be there at least one hour before the time because um, two kilometers to the venue, you could get stuck on the way. And five minutes, as I said, five minutes late, the, the business is canceled automatically. Thank you very much. So let's hear Emmanuel. Thank you, Moses. Emmanuel, uh, let me unmute you. Oh, okay, Good Manuel. evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Manuel. I can hear you. Yes. Um, so if he's having a meeting on the 30th, the first thing he has to do is at least prep to be at the location where the president would be, presumably Abuja, at least two days before the meeting, two to three days, just in case. Then the day before the meeting, he should already know how many minutes it takes him from the location, his location to, um, also, I'm still assuming is Abuja, Aso Villa. So he has to know how many minutes does it take me to get ready, to get prepared, to, to go from this location to Aso Villa. If you have any friends that have gone for meetings with the president before, he also needs to know how long it will take him to clear security to get to the point where they will recognize his presence. So he has to make calls, just do everything to be prepared to be there as early as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more person there before I read the comments. Um, okay, nobody's hand is raised up again. Thank you. So I have comments. Somebody said it should sleep over in Lagos. So I think the president is in Abuja. Uh, Come on, you are going So we are, we are strongly assuming here that the president is at the seat of power, which is Abuja. Uh, Sumba Williams said, possibly flight delay, which is what may go wrong. So to avoid flight delay, you should travel the day before and check into a hotel close to Asura. Fantastic. Okay, Omoni um, said, uh, traffic issues can happen. Uh, Oja said, you should plan ahead. The likely factors are traffic, roadblock that happens without notices. He should plan his outfit, document he will be needing, okay? Uh, Ali, you said, go a day before the meeting and stay close to the venue of the meeting. And uh, Sarah said, 
gets to Abuja a day before, lodge in hotel close to Mr. President location, leave the hotel before crash. Now, one thing I want us to realize, okay, uh, Moses is saying that you suggest he gets to the venue three hours before the time. You should map uh, stakeholders like chief, staff, chief of staff, uh, to keep him abreast of uh, the president's timing. Now, one thing I want you to understand is that risk happens anywhere, anytime, any day, and anyhow, uh, either pre-informed or not pre-informed. Now, this teaser is just telling us that there was an objective. That objective is to win a contract worth $2 billion. That was the objective. I want to win a contract worth $2 billion, and I must not be late to see the president. Otherwise, the project is automatically canceled. Uh, like we said, so many things can happen. We can have false casting. We can have aviation people having problem, like we had on Monday, and you can't go by road, okay? If that was the day you want to travel. If you say you want to take first flight in the morning, which means you're gonna miss the uh, you're going to miss that appointment because, you know, a vision strike happened on Monday. So, uh, again, so many things can happen. Uh, that man may fall sick, the president may fall sick, there may be civil unrest, there may be good deterred. There will be so many things that can happen. But let me tell you this. There are things within your controls. There are things outside your controls. So, that takes us to what risk is really defined as. Let me ask us again, what do you think the word risk connotes to you? From here, risk, you know, we've been able to find out, okay, we have an objective, anything can happen to our objective that may help us, you know, I mean, that may affect us achieving those objectives. We've been able to see that from this knowledge teaser. And from our conversation, what do you think your perception of risk is? What, how would you define a risk? Anybody, is anybody ready to help us? How would you define a risk? What does the word risk mean to you? We're not going to risk management now. What does the word risk mean to you? Anyone, please? If you want to speak, please, I'll be glad you raise up your hand. Okay. Anyone, please? What does the word risk mean to you? or you can send us a chat in the chat room. Sorry, can you all hear me? Hello? Okay. Now, okay, thank you. The response is coming. And you said possible danger. That's a possible danger of an exposure. Uh, okay, thank you, Jiro, for hearing me. Possibility of hazard. Uh, so most of the risk is possibility of something bad happening. Okay, risk of possibility of something bad happening. Okay, yeah. uh, okay, thank you very much. Possibility of loss or danger. Uh, Vivian said, uh, probability, danger, hazard, possibility of something negative may happen. Uh, okay, risk or potential hazards um, that may hinder our plans. Okay, Abiodun, thank you for that. Ejiro, possibility of something good or bad happening. Thank you, Ejiro, fantastic. Uh, risk is uncertainty. Okay, now let me tell you this. Thank you very much. Tim Topai said, what can alter expected objective, upside or downside? You see, something bad may happen, okay? Something bad may happen and it may not alter your set objective, okay? If you intend to meet the president, okay? And something bad happened along the way and uh, it doesn't even affect you. For example, you are moving from Lagos to Abuja and along the line, there was uh, a thunder strike on another plane. It does not relate to you. It doesn't stop you from flying because you have an objective. So that doesn't affect you. Something bad may happen 
and not alter your objective and not alter your plan and not alter anything. So how do we now define risk? According to ISO, um, ISO 31,000 uh, certified uh, person, these are the standard definition. So risk is any event, any phenomenon, substance, circumstance, process, people, or location. Don't forget people or location, uh, which has the potential to alter a set uh, goal or goals or objectives relative to probability of that risk happening and the degree of its impact. What is the probability that there will be traffic and that traffic will alter my objective? Then it becomes a risk to me. If traffic happens and it doesn't affect my objective, for me, it's not a risk or it doesn't have potential to alter my objective. For me, it's not a risk. Okay, that's what ISO is telling us here, ISO 31000, that risk is that phenomenon, that substance, that event, that activity, that process that has the potential, don't forget the potential. Risk is futuristic in nature, okay? Risk is not retrogressive or it is that, uh, let me say, like reactive. You don't, re it's not good to react to risk because the damages could have been done. So you need to be, more proactive about uh, risk in order to ensure that you keep risk in check. So it's an uncertainty that's around future events. For example, COVID was a global risk. Nobody expected COVID that was going to happen. It crumbled so many organizations, so many lives were lost, so many jobs were lost. So it's it altered so many people's objective. In fact, it altered the progress of the world. So the world's objective is to progress, okay? But COVID restrained everybody and brought us down to that level. So risk is that event that can alter your objective. And of course, many times they are quite very uncertain. The level of risk is expressed in the likelihood and impact. What is the likelihood that traffic is going to hold me? What is the likelihood that there will be aviation uh, uh, unrest, okay? so. What are the potentials? You need to look at the probability of this thing happening. And of course, if they happen, what are the impacts? What are the impacts that may likely affect us? What are the impacts that may likely affect you as an individual? We have an objective, and we said that objective cannot be achieved because certain things will happen. We need to know those things that will happen. Okay, so that is the definition of risk. I just want to lay that fundamental, so I'm going to roll fast. Now, risk is not bad things happening. Risk can also be good things not happening. We've seen people who say, oh, well, well, bad things not happening, no, we're fine. And from our definitions, I can see we're always talking about hazard happening, bad things happening, bad things may not happen at all. But if good things are not happening, it's also a risk. If good things are not happening, it is also a risk. Let me make a check again. Please, can you all hear me? Please, if you can hear me, let me know. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. So, risk can happen, you know, at any time. But our perception of risk are quite very narrow. Very, very narrow. That is why for us as HR practitioners, we need uh, a broader knowledge of risk management, you know, to be able to identify risk. Many times we have limited perception of risk based on our experience, based on our roles. Our, our awareness of risk is quite very low. Let me share this with you and it relates to HR. We had a particular time that a young man, a lawyer was coming into an organization and at the point of interviewing that young man, I remember telling the organization that, please, this guy is going to be a big risk in this organization. Now, the question I put across to him, I said, if you have an issue with your colleague at work and uh, it's something that is, you know, that the person said to you, like the person said, you are a thief, how would you react? The guy said, ah. I would just woo him slap. Now, why would you, would you be calling me? I said, okay. Now, 
You know, scenario-based questions during interview helps you to know some things about people. Immediately, the guy said that, I said, oh, are you joking? He said, no, that is not joking. Uh, da, 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 da. The guy, I said, okay. I told him, I said, well, I said, for your role, you need more patience, you know. And um, I just gave it to him there. I don't think you're a good candidate. But because the guy was quite very eloquent, very intelligent, I don't take that from him, very, very intelligent, but it was not a culture fit. So I told the MD there and then, I said, I don't think we need this guy. He said, we need him. I said, okay, let's go ahead and hire him. Guess what? This guy became a bone in the neck of the MD. So whenever we go for a meeting and the MD calls me back there, he's just, look, he's just been praying and fasting for the guy to go. But I said, well, you have something, I mean, to deal with. So what am I saying? At times, especially for HR managers at the point of hiring, our risk perception of the candidates are quite very low. We cannot predict human beings, but there are certain things that you can do that you can probe to be able to know. And this is one of the biggest risks we face as HR practitioners. Our perception about risk is quite very, very, very low. We don't uh, really know much about people that we're probably bringing into the organization because of the way they do. There are deeper things about risk. We are more ignorant of so many things in risk management. Let me tell you this. As a risk man, as an HR practitioner, you're expected to have certain deeper knowledge, certain deeper understanding of risk antecedents that comes with people management. There are three major risk areas that can destroy any organization, that can destroy and render the organization useless. Number one is people risk. Number two is financial risk. And number three has to do with the strategic risk, okay? You can, if you get the strategy wrong, you can just finish the organization. But I just want to dwell on people risk. If you look at all risk happening in every organization in the world, every organization, they are either, in fact, every risk for us as risk managers, uh, being in a, in a conversation somewhere in New Jersey that we reach a conclusion that the bottom line of every risk is people. That's just it, we just people. If you're talking of fraud, it's people that perpetrate fraud. If you see cyber crime, anybody designing anything to circumvent the system, it's just human brain, it's just people. So we have quite a lot to manage people. The Barron's Bank, the biggest frauds that happen all over the world, the Barron's Bank fraud and all those things, all these things happen with people. So risk management happened with people. And I want to tell you also that, you see, if you don't, uh, manage people very well, you may find it difficult in adding value to the organization. And that is why many times for us as HR practitioners, we have lots on our table to deal with, okay? So this night, part of what we'll be sharing is for us to open our minds to learn more about risk, especially people risk. People risk can be very, very dangerous. So risk is managed across different spectrums in organization from the boardroom to the uh you know to uh the gate man sorry somebody is writing on our screen uh let me unshare so that i can reshare please i want to plead with you that uh, don't write on our screen please please uh sorry can you still see me i don't know if you can still hear me okay i can see you and hear you okay can you see the screen also Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so the board of directors are ultimately responsible for risk in terms of decision making, establishing sound corporate governance, uh, ensuring that a strategy exists for the organization and it's well implemented. Uh, the board of directors need to understand risk and risk management to create value and drive risk culture within an organization and also embrace the essence of risk and risk management. Uh, last year, 2022, have the privilege of training over 12 board of directors in blue chips and non-blue chips company on risk management. I remember in one of the risk management classes, when we were done, the chairman of the, of the board, he said, he put his hand on his head, he said, ah, he said, we're in trouble. And I said, well, he said, they are sitting on keg of uh, gunpowder, you know, <laughs> so, 
I don't know what they meant by all those things, but of course, internally they could see. Risk is not to create fear for you, it's to open your eyes to things that are likely dangerous around you. And there are a lot that happens in HR that many times we overlook, we don't see, we don't pay attention to. And when those things happen, they face us. And again, it may just make us to look incompetent. So we're going to talk about that later. Now, we also have the management being responsible for risk to strength and risk culture, implementing the strategies by the board of directors for effective day-to-day -day business management, monitoring and reporting risk. Let me tell you one thing. As a risk manager in some organization where I've worked, I did not see everything. It's people that see risk and they come to tell me based on the risk culture, based on the risk architecture that was designed in that organization. Again, for employees, they can identify risk. Let me tell you one that happened in an organization uh, where I worked before. There was a particular time, uh, the, my office was just opposite a particular club. So the guy in my office, a gate man, told us and said, we should not be closing late. And we said, why? We work late, so allow us. He said, no, there are times, some of the guys coming to this club, they have guns and some of them appear like ruffians, like thieves. So we just said, okay, yeah, 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 maybe. But guess what? In one of the days when we were closing late around 11 o'clock, we saw one of the guys with AK-47 snatching vehicle from someone. And we're like, oh God. So what does that mean? The, the gate man was able to spot a risk for us and able to try to save our lives. So for us as uh, HR practitioners, we are the process owners of people management. We should put our, our sensibilities, our energies around how to be part of risk management process. And in all my experience uh, in managing risk, in people risk management, I engage HR quite a lot. And in our engagement, we always have fruitful outcome, even identifying employees within the system. So there are different types of risk. You have the risk you can control. You also have the risk you cannot control. Sorry, I'll be very fast from here uh, because of the time. Uh, you know, We have risk you can control. We have the risk you cannot control. There are certain risks that you cannot control because they just happen spontaneously and they are by factor of uh, nature. For example, natural disaster, political risk can happen. You don't have control over this. And of course, can have civil unrest. There are several uh, examples of non-controllable risk. We always tell people in risk assessments that you look at both the one you can control and the one you cannot control. For the one you can control, deploy resources. For the one you cannot control, you can give a third party to manage it for you then you can have risk based on the application. We have the inherent risk, you have the residual risk. Now, inherent risk is the risk that exists before you apply control. So let me give an example of inherent risk. It is inherent that you're likely going to hire a wrong staff. It is inherent that you're likely going to make a wrong computation in your company. It is inherent that you're likely going to have on disciplined staff, okay? It is inherent that people will not comply with the uh, HR policy. So those things are inherent. They, they are natural, okay? So sorry, they are quite very natural. There are things that can exist. No, so what do you need to do next is to find a way of developing controls to reduce or eliminate that risk, to reduce or eliminate that risk. Now, let me tell you one thing with, that, with risk elimination. In my experience, it's quite very difficult to totally eliminate risk. What you can just do is to reduce that risk to zero or to, no, not to zero, to a level that you can manage. And that is when you now have residual risk. That, okay, after applying control, for example, it is inherent that I can hire a wrong staff. The control there is uh, background check. And of course, I've seen many organizations, they say, we don't need background check because you already, no, 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 no. You do background check. Even for employees that have left you and come back, do background check. Because sometimes we just leave these things and feel like, oh, we know them. No, they are quite, you know, at times they come back to slap us in the face. So there are different types of risk. You have strategic risk, which is the risk that the strategy will fail. Political risk is the risk that the political activities of 
uh, an organization, I'm talking about internal politics now, can affect the achievement of organizational goals. So some of us, we are in organizations where politics are going on. And what that is telling us is that there is potential that that risk can affect us. We can also have external political risks that we have now. Uh, I'll give a clear example. When there was see, this uh, this Lekki Gate issue, people went to TVC, okay, because they believe that the owner of TB TBC has a political, uh, as a politician, you know, he, he could have done something better. So organization can suffer political risk if they have political affiliations. Country risk is the risk that that country you are doing business with or that country where you are hiring from uh, has very bad reputation. For example, Nigerians are not allowed or advised, let me use that word, advised against hiring from countries like Afghanistan, you know, because of terrorism happening there. So operational risk is a risk of failure of policy, process, people, and of course, external events uh, happening. Legal risk is the risk of litigation as a result of breach of legal uh, contracts or some other legal related matters. Reputational risk is the risk that an organization will lose its reputation as a result of certain activities. Compliance risk is a risk that an organization will be sanctioned for not complying with regulatory standard. Whereas market risk is a risk of high volatility, high and adverse volatility of interest rate, foreign exchange, and prices of commodity. Uh, liquidity risk is a risk that an organization will not be able to meet its immediate obligation, you know, considering the fact that, yes, it has asset, asset but it doesn't have value to meet uh, a short-term uh, obligation. Then we have uh, investment risk is the risk that an organization or an individual will lose both the capital and the expected return on investment. Settlement risk is the risk of delay in meeting certain obligation, okay? You, you delay in meeting them. Even uh, staff salary, I think, is classified under settlement risk. Environmental risk, uh, again, is the risk that the environment where you operate from can be at high risk. And this is one of the risks that HR practitioners should focus on. Uh, that is environmental risk. For example, if you look at your environment where you are operating from, what are the risks that can happen there? And what are the likelihood of events happening? Uh, there was a particular lady that lost her life very close to uh, Bagada, on the other side of Bagada. Uh, it was, that environment is a very volatile environment, prone to criminals, and she was she closed the lid that time, and she was robbed. So in the verge of trying to struggle with the rubber, it, I think it stabbed her on her neck, you know, destroying her, uh, her veins. So she lost her life in that way. So we also need to look at the environment where our employees are working. Very important for us as HR managers. And these are some of the things that leads to payment of hazard allowance in so many other clients. You just look at the work environment and say, okay, the hazard is quite very high. So why can't we just be additional for these people? So what is risk management? Risk management is the entire process that involves uh, you first identifying the risk, uh, also managing the risk. Now, one thing that is very clear that we should put our minds on here with respect to risk management is the fact that the board of directors, the management, excuse me, and all the personnel are responsible for the management of risk. And of course, you should manage your risk within your risk appetite. Let me give you an example, how risk appetite relates to HR. Uh, it's, there are certain level of tolerance you can take, okay? It's your appetite that, for example, you cannot hire more than the number of staff you need. So that's your appetite. If we need 100 staff within our manning level analysis, that is the number of staff we should have. So we shouldn't have extra, okay? But the situation where your management, one of your management or director is pushing for additional role, which is going to affect your overhead and all that, then you are going outside your risk appetite that you cannot contain, or uh, you, you're looking at critical roles after you've done your critical role analysis, and you're not seeing that there are certain individuals that are not, that are posing risk within the organization. Let me mention one, key man risk, okay? If you do an analysis within your organization, you identify certain key man risk. 
And if you notice that this person's role is quite very critical, and if he fails to do certain things, things may go wrong. Now, what are the consequences of having this person as a key man risk? If the consequence is quite very high, I'll just advise you to say, oh, you know what, you have to let off that staff. Example, case study is Lionel Messi with Barcelona. I was happy that he was asked to go, right? In fact, I was envisaging it because at the point his wage bill was quite very high and they could not manage him. Yes, fantastic talent, but they couldn't manage him. So he was stepping beyond their risk appetites and they had to let him go. So one of the things we should look at is their practitioner and the criticality of roles and also look at the talent man in them so that we don't keep a very beautiful, dangerous person within an environment. So it's an holistic approach, but uh, it, uh, managing risk comes with different benefits. It helps you to manage your costs, minimize your losses. Uh, losses could be financial and non-financial losses and keeps you better prepared, even for external uh, challenges. It's also helped you to have a risk-based strategic decision that you have to take as an organization and provide an objective basis for the use of funds, especially people costs. How do you account for people costs? Uh, then with very sound risk management, uh, clients will have confidence in you and also demonstrate proactive risk uh, stewardship, meaning you concentrate on risk in your decision making, in your strategic manpower planning, in uh, compensations and benefits. Let me tell you this. I've seen a situation where a young guy with a very sound talent within the tech space, very good guy, uh, the boss uh, told me that this guy got an appointment and employment somewhere and the guy came out for additional pay and he was given the additional pay. Then after some time, he said he got another bigger offer somewhere. So he said he doesn't want to lose the guy. You know what I told the MD? I said, let him go. He said, no, if I lose this guy, I'll be losing X, Y, Z. I said, let him go. Develop people inside. Let him go. It's just for a while that you're going to lose business, but you will stabilize as the organization rolls on. Uh, he didn't agree with me. He decided to keep the guy, but as a, at a certain point, the guy became a problem to him because the guy was always asking, was always asking. At the point, he got tired of the guy. So the guy now, he got tired of the guy when the guy asked for an uh, official vehicle. And I told the guy that, hey, you can get out. But I told him that that was too late because many other employees within the organization had already left, you know, just, I mean, grudgingly thinking that that guy was giving more preference above them. So for us, there are so many things that can happen uh, within our organization that can affect uh, risk uh, perception. Again, if employees, especially in industrial relations, asking for more pay, how do you protect the organization? And how do you ensure that, yes, as stakeholders, you consider them? I was involved in a negotiation, I mean, uh, recently, uh, I think day before yesterday, or you know, yesterday, day before yesterday and yesterday, it was a very high level negotiations. Uh, the union in a particular organization, very big organization, they brought their demands up. I said, so this is our demand. Uh, on the other side, we had the management saying that we cannot meet up with your demand because of the cost of uh, living and blah, blah, blah. So. Uh, they couldn't broker a deal, you know, there's something called negotiations and collective bargaining, they couldn't reach that point. So I had to step in and see how we can reach, uh, we can reach a conclusion. All I just did was economic analysis. And after the economic analysis, the question I asked the union is, you've seen the outlook of the country, you've seen the organizational performance, what do you want to act for? So we're able to get to a very good point, okay? Now, what are the fundamentals of risk and risk management? Let me just go into risk management process. Sorry, I mean, take a little bit of time, maybe in the next 25 minutes, I should be done, giving room for questions. Uh, risk management has to start with the context of the risk. In what context do you want to manage uh, risk, okay? Are you managing risk to save the costs? Uh, are you, what, what is the basis, what is your basis for managing risk? You need to be very clear uh, on that. Sorry, I cannot see the chat. Perhaps there's a question in the chat room. I cannot see the chat, you know, from here. So forgive me. Uh, Mr. Josh, are you there? Yes, please. please. In case there is a question that I cannot see, you can help me with it. No problem, thank you. Okay. Okay. 
So back to uh, risk management. So this is a risk management process. The first process in risk management is to establish the context of managing that risk. Do you want to eliminate the risk? Do you want to reduce the risk? Do you want to avoid the risk? Do you want to share the risk? So you need to have that in mind. Then please, for you as a, a process owner, you need to have a thorough understanding of your process before you can manage the risk. No matter how intelligent you are, no matter how brilliant you are as a risk manager, if you don't understand the context of managing a risk, you will get it wrong. I'm speaking from experience. You will definitely get it wrong. And of course, you have to also uh, understand uh, how to identify risk. You know, risk identification can come in several ways. Uh, first, it can come with brainstorming. You can note it down. It's not written anywhere. Uh, brainstorming with your colleagues. This is one of the ways you can identify risk. You can identify risk through uh, what we call uh, risk control self-assessment, RCSA. Risk control self-assessment means you're asking yourself in your, your, I mean, within your process, HR process, whether you're in learning and development, you're in compensations and benefits, you're in performance management. The question is, what are the risks that can likely face? You will know better than it. I mean, any other person. Then another way of identifying risk is simulation. If fraud happens in company A, can it happen in our own company? So let us do a simulation. Let us see what can possibly go wrong, okay? So those are the kind of ways you can identify risk. You can also identify risk by what we call a walkthrough test. Okay, look at the process from end to end. What are the likely areas of risk? An example of that, let me pick in compensations and benefits. In an organization where the financial controller is the one preparing the payroll, is the one computing the payroll, is the one paying the payroll, there's nobody that is che doing checks on him there. The likelihood of committing error is there and it may conceal the error. I have worked in an environment before. Immediately, I, I assumed duty. The first person I went for was a financial controller. And I had to check payroll in the past two years. I discovered that the financial controller has been paying tax, his own tax, from the company's pocket. 100% of his tax are from the company's pocket. So his, his gross is his gross takeaway. I mean, take home. So his gross was 12 million, uh, no tax from him, no pensions from him. He takes his 1 million uh, every month. And the pension and tax, everything, he put the burden on the organization. So immediately I discovered that, I just say, hey, this is a fraud. I had to open that up. So uh, the right process, the ideal process, based on Deloitte's uh, uh, process walkthrough is for HR to prepare the payroll. You have an internal control system that checks the accuracy, the completeness, the cut off of that payroll being prepared. Then it goes to the approval process. Finance person is just to pay. Finance is not to be responsible for preparation of payroll. That is the best practice. Please, you can quote me anywhere. I will be ready to answer to that. There is a document by Deloitte years ago that we sat down, we looked at it, and said, this is the best practice. But organizations choose to do what they want, and we won't blame them. They all have reason. Now, you go to risk analysis. Risk analysis is looking at the probability of occurrence of a risk and the impact when that risk happened. Now, probability could be that it could happen on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, there's probability that it could happen weekly, it could happen monthly, quarterly, half yearly. You know, you, you mark probability of occurrence to the frequency of that operation. Let me give you a typical example. There is probability that there will be error in payroll every month because payroll activity happens once in a month. There is probability there will be error in appraisal once in a year. Why? Because Appraisal happens once in a year. So that is the frequency, that is the probability that it will happen once in a year. But if it happens, what's the impact? Okay, you can divide impact based on the risk appetite of your organization. Because of want of time, I don't want to go into detail of that. Once you do risk analysis and evaluation, the outcome is just quite very simple. 
it helps you to profile your risk into high, medium, low. You can put it as very high. You can put it as high. So it depends on the way you want to categorize your risk. But one thing is this, for us, you, we need to identify high risk as HR practitioners. I'm gonna talk about some of the risks that we face uh, very soon. Now, once you see that you have profiled the risk, the next question is how do I manage this? How do I treat this risk, okay? What are the controls am I, I mean, that I need to apply? to reduce this risk. That is when you need to discuss a lot with us, the risk managers. And of course, the fact that you have designed control around the risk doesn't mean that you should go to sleep as HR practitioner. You monitor from time to time. And when you identify anything that is quite different, the next thing you need to do is to escalate. Okay, is to escalate. For example, it could even be that people are taking too much leave and you need to escalate. I say, why are people going on leave? You know indiscriminately. So uh, again, I talked about the concept of inherent and residual risk. The strength of managing any risk is the design of the control. Controls must be stronger than the risk. Sorry, I, I think I, when I come to managing risk for HR managers, I'm going to mention that. Uh, you must make sure that you design control that is very, very strong. Let me tell you an example. At the point of recruitment, it's possible that a candidate lies about its pay. It's a risk to that organization. Now, what is the risk that is the risk that you may be paying somebody above what he or she deserves? What are the controls that you put in, 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 in place? Now, I'll tell you funnily at this point, you don't need my bank statement to know, uh, to know whether. I'm lying or I'm not lying. You don't need my pay slip to know. I can doctor my pay slip. I can doctor my bank statement and still bring them to you. And of course, if you want to say you want to confirm from the bank, probably you find the same thing there. But have you really, really addressed that risk? No. How do you address such risk? Fine. You need to uh, contact the uh, previous employer uh, to ask for the range of pay some previous employers will not respond to you, okay? Now, what are the other types of controls that you can put in place? First is to have a pay scale. That can be a very fantastic control. If you have X years of experience, you have X qualifications, you have X, you set your criteria, and that will help you to say, you cannot earn more than this. We cannot pay you more than this. So that is a very, very strong control I've seen. Whether you come with one year experience and you say that you are earning $500 billion, well, we can pay you more than 1 million. So we can look for another person that fall within our range. Now, you can only go outside your payroll uh, to address that issue and make it clear if that person remains highly significant to the business and it has more benefits than cost, then you have to communicate to employees. Otherwise, it can create bad blood within an organization. So I see that as a very, very strong control. You have a salary scale. This is the scale we're going to place this guy. He's not going above it. You know, collecting pay sleep and all those things. Hey, even asking for the person's previous salary, I don't think it's a sound control, okay? I think if you have a question on that, you can drop it for us to address it. I'm not moving quite very fast because of our time. Now, there are major risks that we face in HR, and I'm going to mention them based on the value chains we have. And please, maybe you have to take note here, OK? Uh, yeah, somebody say organizations have their uh, appraisers quarterly, fantastic, OK? That can happen. Uh, the frequency of occurrence of an activity will determine how often the risk can be identified. So some of the major risks we face in HR function, let me start with recruitment and at least you can take a note from here. First is recruitment error, hiring the wrong staff. It can happen, it's a major risk in recruitment. Paying uh, a candidate more than you know, what he or she should earn at that point can be a very big risk at recruitment. Again, if you're having extended recruitment days, it can affect a function, it's a big risk. Having extended recruitment days beyond certain number of days, then 
uh, one risk that people don't pay attention to in, in uh, recruitment is poaching staff from another organization. You know, if you poach from another organization, mind you, they can poach from you. Uh, I would like you to read Cola Wars. There is a book on that, a case study that can help you. Another one that has to deal with recruitment is renegotiation of terms with candidates. After you have given the candidates an offer, you now come back to tell the candidates and say, no, something is changing. Uh, the other uh, uh, recruitment errors like non-approval of staff, you know, you don't say that staff was not planned for in the strategic workforce plan. So why are you hiring the staff? Yes, expansion can happen, you need justification. Then one of the, some of the biggest risks we've seen in hiring is when people circumvent the process, they bring their friends, their families into the system, and those people become demons in their neck, okay? Uh, I think what I can do with all these major risks, if I check my archive, is to bring a sheet that is a blank sheet. One eye is quite very small for me to talk about all this, okay? So I think I'll share the blank sheet with Mr. Uh, Adeoshin for us to use. Uh, in workforce planning, the basis of workforce, the wrong basis for workforce planning can be a major risk. And if you get that wrong, you get it wrong for the remaining part of the year. If you have a very wrong budgeting standard for uh, workforce planning, it can be very wrong. And of course, if you have your workforce planning not aligning with your organizational strategy, that is a big risk. In terms of compensations and benefits, wrong computations of compensations and benefits, underpayment of staff uh, remuneration, payments uh, of salary and benefits already exited staff, staff that has gone that are still paying salary is a very, very big risk under compensations and benefits. Non-compliance with regulatory standards, one of the biggest risks in on, under compensations and benefits. Career management, lack of career management standard, lack of career management policy, lack of career ladder, and lack of career growth plan is a very big risk. Performance management system, lack of the right performance management tools. I hear some of my colleagues in HR space tell me some tools I've never had before, and it's counterproductive. Lack of understanding of performance management tools can be a very big risk, especially for the process owners like the line managers. Failure to even train on performance management can be a very, very major one. Subjective performance appraisal or performance monetary outcome. Uh, failure to design performance improvement plan for non-performing employees. All these are bigger risks that we need to pay attention to. Exit management. Failure to exit employees in the appropriate manner is a very big risk. This has led to so many litigation, and that is where we call unfair dismissal. Okay, we've seen organizations that dismiss staff through SMS, through whatever means. You know, this is coming up with a lot of litigations in the legal space, okay? Uh, I'm just running through all this because of time. We also have uh, uh, ethics and disciplinary process that is being circumvented, not clear. We have uh, human resource strategy not aligning with organizational strategy, and also human resource strategy that is based, that is designed based on one theory that was taken from America or Europe and is not working here. You know, you design your human resource strategy based on the needs of the organization, based on the goals of the organization. It's not based on what one uh, uh, long green or somebody said somewhere. You know, in nature, we worship people we don't pay attention to our own growth. So just this person said, and I'm like, have you questioned the basis, the context between that person is saying that? So design your strategy to fit, to be tailor-made for your organization. Industrial relations, negotiations, collective bargaining, failure to attend to that can be a very big risk. Uh, sorry, can you still hear me? I just want to be sure that I'm not speaking to myself. Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Then is under there competency. You? <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, under competency management, lack of existence of competency framework, many organizations don't have competency framework. Okay. You just, you know, exist. Competency assessment should be done every day. I mean, sorry, every year, at least to build different competency profiles. Uh, uh, time permitted me, I will have shown you how the competency pro, uh, framework looks like. And the framework is the bedrock of how to access every staff. 
you know year on year by your measurements whether you're having more competent staff or not. You need to have competency identification, competency upgrading, competency grouping, competency mapping, competency definition, competency assessment. All this can also help in learning and development. It helps in promotion. It helps in succession planning. Uh, it has quite a lot of application. And under learning and development, especially in public service, it's taken as if uh, you know you are doing somebody a favor by sending the person on training. You know, not only that, you're also doing the organization a favor. Uh, lack of training needs analysis. Lack of using the right tool. Poor curriculum design. I'm a trainer by the grace of God. I've seen situations where people are trained on what they don't need. They don't need to have that training. But of course, we just bring them up. We design the wrong curriculum. We also have deployment of learning in a very haphazard way, not engaging. People go for training, they come back, they say, oh, that guy spoke fantastic English. But hey, what did he bring in? Nothing. Measurement of uh, evaluation of return on investment on training are not done. Why? Because there's no standardization adopted by organization as the case may be. Uh, again, under HR operation, poor leave management, lack of payment of leave allowance, uh, wrong computation of leave allowance, uh, also uh, abusive uh, abuse of power in the application of leave management. All this, you know, happen. Also, lack of data and information to monitor uh, people uh, management. Then HR costs can be a very, very big uh, area that we need to look at in terms of major risk that uh, HR face. And I'll tell you many times, HR struggle to get their, uh, their costs being approved by organization. So that again is a very big risk. That can affect the way an organization uh, manages its staff because uh, there are three major resources every organization shouldn't play with. Financial resource, human resource, physical resource. But unfortunately, human resource has the highest value, but gets the lowest allocation of cost in every organization. I've been doing research in the Nigerian banking industry for about 10 years, and I can tell you categorically again that, uh, yes, banks are trying in terms of their human resource, but in terms of relative relativity to income, it's not matching up. So banks focus on financial resource more than people resource. But the narratives are changing. Yeah, the narratives are changing. So if you have opportunity working, for example, in the banking industry now, there's likelihood that they start focusing on people development. And of course, compliance with regulatory standard is a very, very major risk. In fact, the risk under that, number one, comes with no lack of understanding of regulatory requirements. Many of my colleagues don't have that framework. There's something in compliance we call compliance metrics. If you have a compliance staff in your organization, ask that staff to give you a compliance metric. All the guiding rules, all the laws should be in that compliance metric. I have a copy. You know, you update your compliance matrix once in a year. It just gives you an idea of understanding the regulatory standards. Sorry that I'm taking your time. Uh, I just want to make sure that I don't skip anything. Okay, so I will run very fast this time around. How should HR managers manage risk? Number one, you need to identify inherent risk. What are the risks inherent in recruitment? What are the risks inherent in uh, compensations and benefits? What are the risks inherent in exit management? What are the risks inherent in career management? The next thing is how do I apply control? And the moment you apply control, it is expected to reduce the risk. And of course, let me quickly explain this to you. You would need this very well. Uh, if the sorry, if the control if the risk is high, also make the control to be extreme here, okay? High risk demands extreme control. So if you have high risk, you can put adequate uh, risk. In this, this is not a good region because when you should always make sure your control is above your risk rating, okay? If you have a medium risk, put high control. If you have high control, put higher control so that at each point you are able to monitor the risk and the control that is what this table is trying to explain to us you know for us as uh, hr managers we need for example like i told you 
when I see people collect space sleep, you, are, you want to catch it. If I think that's my belief, you want to catch somebody that is lying. You want to, and people are smart at you know telling lies. They are very very smart at telling lies, and they will beat the system. Once they beat the system, you see people adjust their age. How do you know whether it's not their age? You know people will say, ah, no, 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 no. You must not. You must present affidavit. Uh, age declaration that is done 15, 20 years ago. And they'll tell you, they'll bring it for you. They will go and doctor it and come and give you. Would you go and ask the court that was this person born in so so so, so year? Or you go and ask the parents. Do you understand? I've seen in some organization public service that they will go as far as your village to you go and meet your, they will send DSS or something to go and meet your parents. I see still that person is failing. You know, it's a very simple thing. What people should hire for should be more competent. By the time you start digging, digging, how's your father, how's your mother, how's this, how's that, people will just know that this is what you do and they will cook what you want for you. And you will swallow it and drink very cold pure water on it. And you will know that you are sitting on fraud, okay? One of the biggest thing that can happen in HR is people fraud. And I think one of the days we shall have a conversation on how people fraud happens. People fraud comes with even having the wrong person in the organization that will be there for a long time. That will be very, that will be in the system for a long time. And you will know the guy is a fraud. One of the people fraud that organization face now is a convention of the process. Start doing, using the organization's time for several things, even using the organizational resources, you know. So just to narrow our conversation here, the higher the risk, this is the best region. The risk is low. The control is extreme. The risk is medium. The control is extreme. The risk is medium. The control is adequate. It's just to ensure that from time to time we manage risk relative to, uh, we manage risk by applying the right control. So the higher the risk, then the control should be higher. So please, you cannot just have this uh, this document here showing you, you know, the description, the actions you should take, and this is the extension of it. I don't want to talk much about this now. Uh, you can, I believe, Mr. Adiosha, are you having these documents? Or once it's recorded, we can forget it. Hello? I hope I've not been speaking to myself. We can hear you, Prof. Sir. Oh, okay. So I was just asking that I can share this document with you, right? Okay, I cannot. Uh... Okay, we'll share the slides. Uh, somebody talk about framework. I don't know the framework. Please make it clear to us so that I know. So in managing risk, you need to look at the probability. You need to look at the impact, and that tells you the risk exposure. Now, um, in managing risk, there are four different ways of managing risk. You either avoid the risk, you share the risk, you accept the risk or you transfer the risk. You avoid risk that you don't have resources to manage, you don't have capacity, you don't know anybody that can manage it for you. You share the risks that you have partial resources to manage and you have another person that can manage it partly with you in partnership. You accept and manage the risk that you have resources for, you manage them in-house. As a matter of fact, as HR practitioner, you are the manager of people risk. That is the truth. The head of your risk management is not the manager of people risk. You are the manager of people risk. Then transferring a risk means that you don't have the capability of managing the risk from that, uh, from that risk to you transfer. For example, outsourcing is a form of strategy of managing a risk. You outsource is a form of strategy for managing the risk. It's not even that it's, it's not relative to the core business. No, it can be a very, very good way of managing a risk. Okay. So, what are the risk outlook? I got something from uh, Marsh and McLennan, uh, and uh, I find it quite very interesting. Quite very, very interesting. Number one is health or safety for out risk outlook in 2023. Many organizations that are recovering from the pandemics and other communicable diseases. You know, there was uh, one disease that is just around lately. I don't know if it's still around. Uh, I know there was, it was broken down. I mean, there was there were cases recorded, I think uh, in Lagos State, in Ogun State, it has not gotten to Ibano or Osho. Okay, so um, globally, as a, Result of recovery from this pandemic, there are other things that we expect to happen in terms of health and safety. 
So we need to focus on employee well-being. I don't know if you are aware that the president of Nigeria in January 11, 2023, signed the mental health bill. So Mr. Adioshima, I think we should have a session to discuss the new mental health bill. You know, it's in line with the lunacy, it's a development over the lunacy act of 1916. Okay, so I think it's something we should talk about. You know, uh, it talks about access to care. It talks about the value you give to people, mental stress, how your organization manage it. It's within the act. Okay, so uh, health and safety also has a lot to do with mental health. A lot of mental health issues globally, HR people are to cope with them and they are coping with them now. So when HR itself has mental health issue, who does he or she talk to? Okay, workforce exhaustion, people should watch that. Otherwise it leads to stress. It leads to drudgery and fatigue. And of course you have work-related illnesses and injury, people having back pain, having headache, breaking down. So mental health, I mean, health and safety is a very good area to focus on for the year 2023. Then we have governance and financial, uh, the administration and fiduciary responsibilities of leadership. And that leads to the, 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 develop, uh, the development of leadership you know, within the organization. We need to also look at the risk of uh, protection in terms of governance. We we'll look at compensation and benefit policy. We we'll look at the reward system under the financial. Can the organization bear it? I'm coming back to Nigeria. This is global. Then we have legal and compliance issues as well as pension issues. These are happening globally. Uh, so many people that lost their life during the pandemics are still getting benefits, you know, from so many insurance companies. And of course, it's expected to heighten uh, this year. Then we have accelerated digitalization where many organizations are going into automation, though facing cybersecurity, data privacy issues, HR tech, some are getting obsolete, some are moving to the app space. So if you're still shopping for software, many people are moving to app space, they are moving to app zone to manage their people. So it's no longer about you having one software that's last you for 50, 100 years. No, technology is changing quite very rapidly. And of course, uh, HR uh, strategy, I mean, HR strategy must not be out of uh, tune with the organizational strategy. Now, this, uh, I want to talk about skill obsolescence. A lot of people, a lot of people are relying on the knowledge they have last year, 2022. Let me sound like a preacher. My dear brothers and sisters, 2022 is gone. Forget ye the former skills and competencies ye have. Lo and behold, there are new skills. You have to do thorough analysis and research and know what can work for you going on. Otherwise, I will tell you, people that are waiting to take your job are still learning now. And by the time they learn, they will take your job without crying, okay? Talent practices is changing the nature of work. A lot of flexibility coming into talent management. Organizations are attracting talent. People have been recruited from Nigeria. They see them as talent and they're stabilizing in their jobs outside. There's something we call global workforce migration. After the During the pandemic, there was a lockdown of over 97 million people moving globally for jobs. You know, they couldn't move that time. The moment the pandemic went, that number spiraled up. And Nigeria is one of the largest uh, people in Sub-Saharan Africa having high workforce migration, okay? Uh, succession planning is also very key. Many organizations are grappling with that. And of course, it's relative to the migration of people, you know, people leaving their position who is to succeed them. The issue of conduct and culture is being viewed and also travel, you know, across different jurisdictions. You know, they allow people now to work in so many of these jurisdictions. Uh, I was having a conversation yesterday on African Continental Free Trade Agreement. There are policy issues that are coming soon that will allow Ghanaians to come and work in Nigeria. They earn like you or more. You know, these are policy issues at the very peak, you know, that conversations are going on. on. Then uh, on environmental and social issue, catastrophic events, working condition, diversity and equity. Then let's get back to Nigeria. By prediction, there are potential job losses because many organizations may have to struggle with operational costs this year. I want to remind you, 
sometimes in November last year or early December, I mentioned that this forecast scarcity we have is going to linger on to the end of January. I know somebody told me that, how oh, do you know it's not possible? But now we have conversation this evening. Yes, how did you get there? See, just by using data, just do your prediction, you're fine. And I want to also give you bad news that this may extend to the end of March. So expect to buy fuel close to about 800 naira per liter around the end of February. And that may go a bit low by early March and go spiral back again. So I'm not giving you bad news anyway. It's just what it is. So that may lead to higher operational cost. Uh, what HR people should do is to start thinking of flexibility of work, remote work, you know, for their staff. And of course, we expect increasing litigation of employees. Uh, last year, it was quite very high. It's going to increase this year as a result of some unhealthy practices, unfair dismissal of employees at workplace that is gradually brewing. My time is quite very running. I want to go into the details of that. There are potential increase in industrial action. Employees are asking for more money from their employers now due to high rate of inflation, lower purchasing power, high cost of living. So the living wage is no longer the living wage. Again, I'll tell you at the federal government level, there are conversations going on on how to increase some of the allowances, not entire salary of staff. Uh, we have increasing cost of maintaining staff. So organization may start looking at how to ration staff and the staff that they are rationing are actually looking for way outside the country and they are being welcomed. So employee may, mobility may reduce a little bit uh, because again, Globally, we expect increase. Nigeria, why I said uh, it may reduce a little bit is because governments are planning some very strict measures for what these people jack by so that they make it difficult for you to leave. Okay. Uh, talent exits will be on the rise. That's after the election. Uh, this employee mobility and talent, it looks contradictory, but from my data, I'm still trying to look at how. Uh, talent exit. Why we talk about talent exit? Uh, it may not even be uh, maybe they are moving out of the country. It may just be within the country because most talents now are looking for more money. So it's money that attracts more talent now. Otherwise, it will have been the same correlation, giving us positive correlation. Now, some expatriates definitely will want to leave because of our election, uh, electoral violence and safety. Work for workplace polarization due to politics. And Peter will be Tinubu. Uh, so all those conversations will happen at workplace. And if they are not well managed, people will have enemies at workplace. Okay. There are certainties around implementation of mental health bill. How would this be uh, implemented and all that? So there are high level of uncertainties around that. Then in the public service, the federal public service, there is an ongoing process for the institutionalization of performance management system as one of the hands of the federal civil service strategic implementation plan 2021-2025, which was approved in December 2021. So uh, all these uh, those things happening within the uh, public space. And of course, expect increase in automation and AI. Once that increase, what do you expect? Technology is getting closer to human. It may be a substitute if you know your onions, but if you don't know your onions, it may be a total obliteration of certain roles in organization, HR inclusive. Thank you very much. I'd like to have questions and uh, before we go, thank you. Mr. Josh, are you with us? Yes, sir. Thank you so I much. I want to take a question from people who have questions. Yeah, I think Esther is raising up her hand. We have completed. Okay. Esther, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Adiosha. Thank you very much, Prof. It has been quite an engaging um, session, and I'm glad I was able to join. Um, so I want to ask um, concerning the major risk in HR course, I mean, in HR rather, uh, when you were explaining um, through all the value chains, recruitment, comp and ben performance, you know, you were kind of rushing through. I know it was because of time, right? And it's just on the slide. I know the slide will be shared, but it's just the bullet points. So those other breakdowns, because I know you actually said we 
we should start writing. I was actually writing, but I couldn't capture everything. So I don't know if um, we can listen to this recording apart from maybe getting uh, the slides so that I can go through yes, them the again because they are. Video will be shared. Uh, the video will be shared. Go to the YouTube channel. I'll drop the YouTube channel again. The chat box. We we'll dropped it like one time. So we'll drop it again. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's someone here, Samsung. I will take a risk. We typically, don't allow people who are unidentifiable to speak. We will take a risk. Just one off risk. Samsung, please. You are being unmuted. Yes, good evening. I'm Biodu. Okay. I'm Abiodun John. Hello, Kele. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's nice uh, being here. I, I want to commend the presenter for a very thorough research and work done. Uh, I will listen to the various risks identified in the HR operations. I just want to ask this uh, fundamental question that in as much as the HR people are aware of this risk on the job, uh, there is uh, this fact that uh, there is little they can do about this risk in controlling them without the support of the management. And I think uh, the management itself, that is the people that own the business, the employer of the labor, need to understand the whole gamut of this risk and how they have affected their businesses. Because in most cases in private sector, these business owners don't listen to HR. All these things, of course, we get to know them, we get to have the impact, but for the fact that they are not measured in terms of Naira and cover, there is little premium placed on the HR people and even on the people that the HR are managing. Because I work in places where all these things are optimized and the man doesn't care. He will tell you that, look, as much as the HR man is an in-house person, he's not in the marketing, he's not in the sales, he's not in the brand, he's not in the, in the public space, they are marketing the business. So staying back at work to manage the entire gamut of the HR business and the people does not really add money to his fault. So he's more concerned with the medical team to do the job. So how do we get to have the buy-in of the business owner to understand the complicity of these risks on their businesses and how they can now partner with the HR as HR is partnering with them on the business to solve this problem? Thank you very much. Okay, Prof. Hello, sir. Prof, you may wish to respond. Prof, are you still with us? Let me see. Just be on standby. Okay. I'm not 100% sure that Prof is still on the call. He might have been taken out by network. But let me, okay. Um, I've made his other number, other device a co host. Hello, Prof, if you can hear us. Let's exercise some patience. Okay, I can hear you. Sorry, I was muted. I couldn't speak. Okay. The internet threw me out when Esther was asking her question, so I didn't really hear. Okay, so I've resolved Esther's question. She wanted to know the recordings will be shared, and I said yes, and I've already dropped the YouTube link where we upload all recordings. So this session will be added there. Oh. Then um, somebody um, asked a question. Please kindly repeat the question, make it more yes. brief. I, I said that uh, we, are, we are quite aware of all this with some of the HR people, but there is little or uh, much that we can do about this risk. I mean, solving them or having to control them without the support of the management. That is the business owners, or let me say the stakeholders, either the board or the chairman or the business owner if it's uh, uh, a sole proprietor. But just as much as we have more knowledge about this risk, I think it is also fundamental for them to have in-depth understanding of this risk as well. Because what they focus more on is the financial risk and the physical risk. They don't look at the people's risk. Even the highest rate of attrition in most companies is also affecting their businesses. But sometimes they don't take, they don't take look at that because they look at the unemployment rate in the country that even if 50 of my staff have to go today, I can employ 60 to replace them. And when, they, when a particular set of staff with certain skills 
that are very relevant to the business. Just looking at the bank sector, recently, several IT guys in the bank sector have had reasons to Japan. And so it's affecting service delivery to depositors. It's also making the banking uh, technology very prone either to fraud and some other sharp practices. So how do we get the business owner to also have this critical buying in in understanding the scope of this risk and also partnering with HR, just as we partner with them on the business to solve this problem? Because once this problem are solving, then they can now say, oh, HR is working. But when the problem is being solved by the HR people and they are not supporting them, of course, there's no way you can say, okay, the HR man is working. So it's only when you get to see the finance man paying salary, other things that, oh, the finance man is working, but the HR man is just there doing nothing. So that's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I respond to that? Yes, yes. sir. Yes, bro. Okay. I'll, I'll just call you Mr. Samson because I don't know your real name. Okay. I'm Abiodun. Oh, okay, sir. Now, uh, Abiodun, you raised something quite very fundamental. I did mention that last year, some HR practitioners, I don't want to mention names anyway, invited me to the organization to talk to their management and board about risk. And I told you that the chairman of one of the organization put hand on his head and he said, ah, that they are in trouble. Many times I showed you the risk perception. The perception that they have about people risk is quite very low. And I want to tell you, eh, any organization that plays with its HR function is dead. They may be breathing, but they are dead. Now, how can we sell these things then? We can use data. Let me tell you an example. For example, the Jackpot syndrome we talked about. What is the financial implication on organization? For example, the financial system in Nigeria has scarcity of tech staff, huge scarcity. Yes. They are ready to pay any amount to get them. Now, why wouldn't they have reacted, having been proactive before now? What are the other dangers? You see, why I said this, that I, I was mentioning some risks, time wouldn't permit me. Even as far as wrong hire, you know, what are the risk elements there? If you make them to know, maybe in your report, you just put it certain elements for you to poke their risk mindset. I can tell you, they start listening to you. Let me give you one, one example. We had a data analytics training like five, seven years ago, five, seven years ago. Now, we picked the data, a young man picked the data and looked at the cost of uh, hiring. Do you understand? Cost of hiring staff, cost of onboarding them, cost of documentation. They had very high attrition rates. Now, the replacement cost that is in form of recruitment cost now, is, it was increasing. So the guy now did an analysis where he showed the MD that I think in a particular year, they spent almost 17 million Naira mm. as recruitment, like replacing staff. The MD shouted and said, how can, their focus was now, how can we retain our staff? That was when the MD now started listening to the HR person. Okay. Another thing that made management not to listen to HR is because uh, HR doesn't even use data in presenting their case. Many times it's by perception. Perception. You know, if you use data to tell somebody something, the person will sit well. I mean, if you come and tell people that, Sir, so we're losing 17% of our staff every month, and the implication is that our customers will not be satisfied, blah, 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 by this percent. The person will listen to you. So there is need to use data to speak the language of the business and even language of risk. I don't know if you are with me. I'm very, very with you. But you know, uh, yeah. let me give you, I work in Lagos here. And I work in big okay. firms in Lagos. And uh, I'm privileged to have also worked with uh, people who have traveled far and wide. But do you know what? That even when you give them this analysis, just on table, not, not worthy of tables. So for front desk, five staff have left our business in the last two weeks. And for this five staff, 
for every contact they have with our customers, they are taking it elsewhere. They don't want to listen to any, any of those. They'll just tell you, no, go and look at the quantum of uh, people that are looking for a job. You can get the best hands there, bring them. But unfortunately, by January this year, almost about 12 staff, immediately after December, and they came in in January, 12 staff just stayed away. They didn't resign. There was no mail. They just stayed away from the business because they felt that they were not being appreciated by certain things that happened. And so the moment they left, massively, almost the first week of the year, the man was shot. He was almost crying. And I said, sir, these were things I foresaw, these were things I foresaw and I've already prepared your mind towards them. That HR works closely with these staff. You get to know their personal, their operational issues and other things. And when we are meant to meet all these needs, you tend to play them down, thinking that buying the machines, buying the equipment is more important than the people. But it's getting to understand now that look, it is not the machine, it's not the technology that makes the difference. Every other company tends to use the same technology. But more importantly, the people that will drive the process are very fundamental. And every business is standing on three four crop. Number one, the people. Number two, the process. Number three, the system. And it is the people that will manage the other two phases. So that's just it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. Yes. Okay, let me quickly. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just okay. say something. Let me say something to what you just said. Now you see, uh, whether we like it or not, there's organizational politics, and most of these business owners have the belief that uh, you can't tell them anything. In fact, they believe they can recruit more than you until exactly. they get their fingers burnt and they run into troubles before they now come back and say, oh, that you are very right. But one thing is this, whether we like it or not, our role as HR practitioner is purely advisory. You can only advise, yes. you can't force action. Yes. So once you advise, keep it that way. One way or the other, they will make reference to you. So that's one of the things I want to say. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Well done. Yes, sir. So any other question? Hi, good evening. Good evening, Prof and other colleagues. Um, my question is relating to the uh, immigration largely to Europe and also um, the impact of that on uh, excessive, almost un unachievable expectations. So I think this will likely drive people to live on their own, largely because the expectation is too much and they may not be able to cope or handle that. And on the organization, they may likely activate uh, this thing called constructive dismissal in labor law. I don't know if this law applies, uh, I mean, is applicable in the Nigerian uh, human resource space, whether it's uh, captured in our labor laws, somebody can activate a constructive dismissal, that is to ask for compensation for uh, having excessive, uh, unachievable expectation that he is forced to resign. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, Prof. Oh, sorry, I didn't know I was muted. Okay. Thank you very much. Constructive dismissal is something that happens and people are contesting it. It's part of unfair 
uh, HR practice that happened quite a lot in the year 2022, and people are really, really addressing that. So if you ask me, to a very large extent, it happens in this environment. It happens in this climate very well. People are contesting their dismissal. They are also coming up with cases. You know, they are, they are, they are coming up with litigations. Uh, if you want to check, check the uh, Nigerian Industrial Court, the NIC website, there are a lot of cases there. However, one of the biggest problems we have and which I have suffered for in the past within the HR space in Nigeria, once you come out and take your uh, employer, your former employer to court for unfair dismissal, for unfair practice, for something that was wrongly done against you, every other employer sees you as a rebel. They see you as a thug. It means you have to swallow shit and keep drinking dirty water on it, you know, which is not the right thing in any sane environment. So does it happen? Yes. Is this something that is welcome within this space? No way. Do you understand my point? But you have options to either push for it or not, and you can come up with it. So nothing wrong there. I don't know if your question has been answered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I remember telling yes, you off that, uh, Prof, if people have their way, they can do this thing till tomorrow morning. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, we've already exceeded the type Prof uh, thoughts is going to use. But I don't know if there's any major question, one question left. So that we can take it. Prof, people are asking though, they want you to come back and take us on this competency. I don't want to put you on this portal. If you are late, let me know. Anytime, any day, we will arrange. We are ready for you, Prof. I, I, I will love this. Okay. No I really wish I can. Yeah. The competency framework is not one hour talk. It's Absolutely. something that will last. Yeah, because you need to identify competencies, the competency mapping, the competency yeah. dictionary. How do you carry out competency assessment? And how do you do that year on year with reports? Yes. Anytime, uh, if it's within my time, I have quite very busy schedule, but once you tell me, we can arrange. No, well, Prof is perhaps one of the professionals that I know that has done the highest amount of free training that I know. He still even did one this December, just for people to register and that's all. Thank you so much again, Prof. I know sometimes we don't say thank you enough. And on behalf of uh, over 100 people at one point that joined today's session and everybody who have benefited from your generosity, put on the LinkedIn platform, um, the HR mentorship, and yes. all the previous HR WhatsApp group online and offline. I would like to say, I would like to say thank you. I know you're a very humble man. I know you. You know, you will say it's, it's God. Yes, we know it's God. But we thank you for yielding to, to the service of the people and for sharing from your wealth of um, experience again today and as always. Thank you so much, everyone. I think we can call it a wrap so that the uh, prof can prepare for Sunday. Again, just for the sake of one or two people. Sorry, here. some people are asking for physical class, huh? <laughs> no, Allah. Everything is possible. If you want physical class, you buy pandemian for me. I love food. <laughs> you will not. If it's physical, you will pay. Me too. I can't bring prop for free for physical. Abba, you will drive. You will plus pandemian and palm wine. Okay. <laughs> oh, Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. At the end, at yeah. the end, from my heart. God bless you. Um, this year. We agree that if we don't do this risk for HR early, a lot of our HR colleagues will be at risk. We hope Prof has been able to successfully open our eyes, whet your appetite to pay attention to every area in the HR value chain and every area in your organizational value chain so that you don't put your organization at risk you can proactively mitigate risk, know the ones you want 
to absorb, know the one you want to mitigate, the ones you want to you know, transfer, okay? You also have a good appreciation of your organization's risk appetite and the risk appetite for HR within a, a, applicable, reasonable threshold. Feel free again to continue this conversation in our various WhatsApp group. Share the key lessons you have learned today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm emotional right now, but Professor Ari Emadjai, just let me say that. God bless you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye.